call the meeting to order, please. And uh, we can start with our presentations. 2.1, members of the market. Madam Chair, members of the Police Services Board, Chief Chair, Deputy Chief Smeeners and Gert, Senior Officers, Ladies and Gentlemen, my name is Ryan Yodati, I am the Chief's Executive Officer. Today I would like to present the Member of the Month Award. I would like to call Aaron Connell to the front, please. On Saturday, December 29, 2012, the communications branch received an ambulance assist call for a male who had overdosed in his apartment. The narcotic ingested at the accidental overdose was a drug which was taken during a robbery at a drugstore just two days prior. Aaron was the Area 3 dispatcher during the ambulance call and recognized the narcotic as being the same in both incidents. Noting the proximity between the location of the pharmacy and the apartment where the overdose was coming from, Aaron entered comments into the chronology of the call and notified the road sergeant of the correlation. The bear unit continued with the investigation, leading to the suspects being identified, arrested, and charged with the drugstore robbery. Making the link between the two incidents played a vital role in providing assistance with the identification of the suspects involved in the robbery, thus bringing the investigation to a successful conclusion. Aaron, I commend you for your professionalism, your knowledge, skills, and ability in connecting the elements of these events which enabled investigators to successfully bring the suspects to justice. Your dedication to the job and to the community brings great credit upon you, the Hamilton Police Service, and the law enforcement profession. Congratulations. for us and recognize the efforts of uh, all of the members of the service that are involved in the strategy. The strategy being the deployment of the team, the bail compliance unit, the social navigator program, and many other facets that are contributing to community safety. So, Marty. Thank you, Chief. Let's down a little bit here for uh, your purposes. Madam Chair, members of the board, Chief, Deputy Commanders, and uh, others present, uh, thank you for having us this evening. Um, our purpose today is to give you an update with regards to the action strategy. And uh, when I say strategy, uh, uh, bear in mind that we refer to the three main purposes of the action strategy. And it starts out with the operational value of the, uh, the action team itself. And of course, that has since been augmented with two further strategies. That's the social navigation uh, program and the bail compliance unit. So uh, that's our purpose today, to give you an update there. And uh, we'll give you some numbers around what happened in 2012 
but of course in context the success of the strategy itself can only be weighed against uh, at looking at the larger issues in terms of displacement. I know that the Chief has looked at that, so any uh, specific questions around displacement and effects of the strategy overall is something that I know that, that the Chief will be speaking to, and I believe that report will be coming uh, in the very near future. So to, to commence with, uh, it's good to just remember the concepts and principles that the action team was initially constructed. And that is around the growth in understanding and theory with respect to community policing and the principles that make community policing effective. We know that random patrol is something that uh, is, is, generally speaking, an ineffective tactic. And that's why we have deployed the action program uh, according to analysis based on hotspots. And the hotspots that we focused on in the city of Hamilton as a result of the directive by this board in 2009 is specifically general crimes of disorder and violence. And so that is the general principle in terms of understanding the theory behind how and why the action team is constructed. Uh, that understanding and that theory translates very well to what we know about how community mobilization is and should work as per the ministry standards. This, of course, is the model here. And with the goal being that uh, when police agencies and initiatives go into a community, we start out with enforcement and crime suppression initiatives. But ultimately, our end goal is to engage that community to reinvest itself in creating and pro solving its own problems. We know that a police-led solution can be effective in the short term, but it certainly will not be effective in the long term. And so this is the model that we, in fact, subscribe to. In terms of deployment and how we uh, form the basis of those decisions, I won't go over the hotspot analysis again. Uh, that's been in many reports, but just uh, for the purposes of understanding how our quadrants have evolved, uh, downtown, uh, this is the core quadrants here. We have five of them downtown. And if you look at number or letter F in the upper right corner there, that's something that we've added to the strategy. One of the unique pieces of this strategy, of course, we're not confined by ge geographic boundaries. So as issues emerge and as crime stats fluctuate, we can respond accordingly. In fact, we did that last year in 2012 when we added that quadrant. In addition to uh, the downtown quadrants, of course, we have our Concession Street quadrant and then we have our East End McQuestion Quadrant. So that is generally speaking how we make our deployment decisions. Those rosters are done on a weekly basis based on requests that come from crime managers and area concerns as they're brought forward to our attention. That generally informs the basis of how we make those decisions. Also uh, assisting us in, inform in informing us how we make those decisions is the fact that we know that in the core there's at least 20, 25,000 people that are attending for the purpose of employment. Uh, in addition to that, we know that about 75% of those people are in fact uh, residents of the city. And this doesn't measure the numbers over and above that come in for festivals and events. And if you think uh, just this past weekend, of course, having Oprah in town, the, the food, and, uh, food and drink festival, the Bulldogs, uh, et cetera, et cetera, we certainly get a huge influx of people that come in on the weekend. So primarily our weekend deployment is around where the most people attend our city, which is in the downtown core. In terms of other events uh, outside of our, uh, our our basic mandate, there's a number of other things we attend to as a unit and as a strategy. We look after parades, events, and festivals. We look after protests, community events, sporting events, and canvassing. These are all areas that in the past, as a police service, we've been challenged to respond to. Uh, we've either done it ineffectively or ina inadequately, uh, despite our best efforts. Special duty systems are in place. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, depending on the availability of officers. And of course, that's directly uh, related to the, uh, the workload. Um, in this particular screen here, it's probably really important to notice what we're seeing in the second graph there is protests. We've seen a marked increase in protests within the city here. It's a real challenge for us from a resource perspective. It's, it's, it's resource heavy in terms of commitment for us. Um, typically speaking, uh, a protest is generally law abiding, but they do range in terms of civil disobedience. And we see some that are on the low end and some on the upper end. And, and often what will happen is a protest will take to the street, march the wrong way, uh, and do a sit-in at a location. The action team is particularly adept at dealing with this because uh, it's very difficult to do crowd control with cruisers. So we have officers on foot and bicycle, and the bicycles are basically moving barriers. Add to that the mounted unit, and we're able to, to handle that very well. Uh, the other one that's really important to notice on this screen is the canvassing, and you'll notice those increasing as well. Uh, when action uh, initially uh, uh, implemented on the streets, we started just strictly with homicides. We've now expanded that a little bit. Basically, all major incidents that look like they could head towards a homicide is something that the action team will respond to. That, again, is something that in the past, patrol resources have been drained to address that need. 
And if we can address those issues very quickly, sometimes we can eliminate something that appears to be a homicide in very short order. So it's, uh, it's another use that uh, we find ourselves applicable for. Looking at the overall stats in terms of where we deploy, approximately 50 to 75% of our time is spent in the central area, responding between the core itself and Hess Village uh, District. And the rest of the time is found in, in, uh, in, uh, in neighborhoods uh, like Lansdale, Slayton East, East End, and Mountain. Um, so what we need to do in terms of whether or not this is a good balance is look at how does this weigh out on our statistics, both locally within our quadrants and then in terms of the big picture of the city of Hamilton. The second piece is something that I know we'll look at later. The first piece is something that I want to talk about now. Before we get there, PONs last year, the action team handed out 12,500 PONs. 14,000 uh, street checks, so those are individuals that are engaged in some kind of offense that we've encountered during our uh, patrols. And then again, that could be a very minor offense or something more major. Um, really significant is the amount of community contacts and business contacts that we make. Uh, 117, just over 117,000 people, very significant number there. Our arrests for last uh, year, 2,700, up a little bit from the year before. We're seeing a lot of drug offenses in the core, uh, but the interesting thing to note there is that they're soft drug offenses. So it's not the crack cocaine issues that we've seen before, it's more marijuana related issues. Looking at our overall effect, our overall warrants and charges, so with the number of charges that our officers have laid in the action team and the number of warrants that we've executed, generally speaking, we're seeing a trend line going downwards. There's, there was a bit of a spike there in 2012, mostly over the summer months, and again, uh, that's due to, due to uh, some of the drug offenses, the soft drug offenses. But generally speaking, our trend line is going down. This is consistent with what we know will work in a community mobilization model when you see the community reinvest itself, which is in fact what we believe we're seeing in the core. So looking specifically at some of the numbers, uh, moving to Division 2 first, McQuest and Quadrant, robberies are down 45%. Uh, break and enters are up 58%. Uh, keeping in mind uh, two, two very important things here. Uh, we typically do not patrol in the uh, East End region during the daytime. We're typically during there in the afternoon and evening hours. And any of the numbers that you see here are not just action uh, derivatives. They're not just the product of the work done by the action team. This is something that it, it, it should be looked at in terms of perspective with divisional initiatives, whether it be divisional heat teams or patrol officers, pop projects, etc. So this is the cumulative impact in that neighborhood of all those different policing initiatives. Generally speaking, looking at the trend line for McQuesten, a uh, decreasing trend line there. The concession tree, same thing, very positive numbers around robberies and violent crime. Robberies down 47%, violent crime down 10%, uh, and, and that also uh, bears true with some of the other property uh, related crimes. Although uh, we don't uh, directly uh, deploy for property related crime, we do have impact on that by being in those neighborhoods. Again, bearing in mind that this is not just action strategy, this is other divisional ministers that cumulatively uh, make these numbers come together. Interesting, when you look at the numbers here at Conception Street, it, there seemed to be an increase there. Uh, what's important to note about this chart, when you look at 2010, action deployed May of 2010, just after that peak there. Um, this is a, an annual number, so we don't know by month how this pour itself out. So that may or may not be significant in terms of going up to 105 and back down. But again, generally speaking, a decreasing trend line for Concession Street as well. And looking at robberies in our downtown, so moving to our downtown, we're down 60% in our downtown quadrants. And this is the, strictly speaking, the core of the city. Uh, down 40% with our break and enters, down 20% with our stolen autos, 20% theft from our uh, vehicles, and violent crime in general, so this category is quite large, includes homicide shootings and, and all of the, the aggravated uh, crimes, down by 38%, and assaults themselves down by 5%. Again, looking at the trend line, violent crime in the downtown core, uh, very healthy trend line uh, proceeding downward. Hess Village is a completely separate issue for us. Uh, you look at the bottom here and you'll notice an increase of 14%. Um, we are seeing a bit of a challenge there in terms of uh, being able to respond appropriately to some of the assaults that are happening there. Um, there does seem to be a bit of a, uh, a bit of an atmosphere of, of toleration around assaults. Um, I'm not going to speak too much about Hess because I know that Division One under Superintendent Stewart has some initiatives going there, ongoing discussions. Uh, but generally speaking, our robberies are down by 38% in that area, and our violent crime, looking at the major crimes, are down by 19% in that area. 
And again, looking at our trend line there, um, going up in 2011 and back down in 2012. The action strategy has also made significant use of our auxiliary program. And uh, just comparing from 2012 to 2013, we've seen a significant uh, uh, increase in auxiliary hours around our CCTV program. So what this entails is auxiliary officers and volunteers coming into the station, monitoring the cameras, and communicating with our communicating with either the radio room supervisor down in the dispatch center or our action supervisors and calling them and saying, this is what we've just seen. It may or may not have significance. And then the sworn officer will make a decision around how they respond to that or the radio room, in fact, will make a decision around that. And just looking at the three-year comparison, again, quite a significant increase in terms of auxiliary commitment to our program. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, turn this over for the purpose of this presentation. I'm going to be joined by Acting Staff Sergeant Tina Potter and Inspector Rath. I have the pleasure of supervising the uh, Bell Compliance Unit. In 2012, the Delta Police Service started a Bell Compliance Initiative, Crime Prevention Initiative, to deal with the uh, managed repeat and high risk offenders in our communities. The Bell Compliance Unit itself. Here's the mandate right there, again, to manage, repeat, high-risk, violent offenders through education and bill compliance is one of the things that we haven't been very successful in over the years. <clears throat> the bill compliance unit deals specifically with the violent offenses. On this chart here, you'll see all the different offenses that we deal with, conspiracy, extortion, aggravated assaults, homicide, all those kinds of uh, offenses. In 2012, the Bail Compliance Unit conducted 933 compliance checks, and they were dealing with 123 offenders. Over that period of time, in 2012, they contacted 438 sureties. To contact the sureties, what they did was sat down and spoke with them and explained to them what the process was, the court services, so that they can uh, understand what their obligations are. One of the initial stages that we did with the Bell Compliance Unit, <clears throat> excuse me, at the beginning of 2012, was we communicated with the Crown Attorneys and the Justice of the Pieces to educate them on what we needed as a police service to help us to um, deal with the compliance of the individuals released on compliance checks. In order for us to monitor these individuals, we had to have those conditions that we could utilize out in the community. Most of the conditions that we we received to monitor or reside at, which posed a big problem with the bail compliance unit because it wasn't very specific. Anybody just needs to reside. So we had to under get an understanding from the justices and the Crown attorneys on what that reside means. Once we established that and we determined that it has to look like the individual actually live at the house in order for them to um, do any breaches when it comes to the residing. Again, 2012, this is just a chart to show us the checks throughout the months. Compliance checks are in blue, surety contacts are in red, and the fail to comply is in white. In order to see if our bail compliance unit is working, we had a small test group of 30 files that were originally charges were here in Hamilton, but the individuals live out of town. So we checked to see if they were actually being checked on and see what their compliance rate was. We can see their compliance rate was only 70%. On top of that, they had four failed supplies only and five new charges. So that doesn't mean they had new, um, they were on a recog and then they were charged for that failed to comply recog. It was an added new charge, whether it be an assault, whether it be a mischief, whatever that case is. With the Bell Compliance Unit, we had 167 files. 20 of them failed to comply on the conditions that they had, which is an 89% compliance rate. Only two new charges on those um, 167 files, and 18 failed to comply, which were the original charges that we had. The divisions are all broke up, Division 1, 2, and 3. In Division 1, 31% of our files were bail compliance. In Division 2, we had 38 in Division 2. And in Division 3, 31% of our files. 
Like I said initially, uh, the beginning part of 2012 was about educating uh, not only the service but also the Crown Attorneys and the Justice of the Peace in regards to our program. Once we've established that, we now have two new officers that no longer have to do the education component. Their stats have increased incredibly. Just in the three months alone, we've had 461 compliance checks, 201 surety contacts, which is a 200% increase over 2012. I will now turn it over to <coughs> Inspector Raston. I get the, uh, the pleasure to talk about the social navigation program. This is the uh, classifies at risk due to mental health addictions and homelessness that there was repeat interaction with the police. So the police came up with this idea of having a referral system to the agencies within the city. What the Social Navigator program does, it brings all of our social agencies together at one table and it allows us to have open discussions about individuals who need the support of our community and it helps them to get into the proper support systems and proper care. suffers from a, a mental health issue, he's, uh, there's something not right, I couldn't get it out of him what, uh, what the actual condition was. The intent of the program is to identify those individuals through police reference and sometimes external references. And uh, when I saw Patrick this morning, I mentioned this gentleman that we saw yesterday, so when he saw me out on patrol today, we, uh, we stopped just to make sure that uh, you know he's uh, not on the streets, and if I had seen him, and, point about to that. Hopefully uh, get this guy some help. The social navigator now changes the dialogue when we discuss the people with these vulnerabilities to a circle of care. And the social agencies come together to provide the care that they possess. So my role really is to assess those individuals that come to my attention and see how best I can get them connected or reconnected or augment their, their relationship with either a new service or existing service. But the social navigator is a process of getting the proper assistance to people who need it. And a lot of time, it's just about connecting the people with the proper service that they require. In our action strategy officers are out there every single day. You'll see the officers are out there because people who are out on the street that need our assistance, that need the care of the social navigator, they're out there all the time as well, so we will be there to help. The picture's worth a thousand words sometimes. The Social Navigator program is actually a partnership between several different agencies, uh, emergency yeah. services, uh, downtown renewal, uh, the neighborhood development strategy, uh, community services, and like I said, Pat described in the, uh, in the introduction, the action officers were always encountering at-risk people or people who are repeat offenders. But they wouldn't know what to do. So what they do is they refer to Pat. Pat actually does what they call a triage, he comes up, finds out what the root cause of the problem is, whether it's addictions, whether it's housing, whether it's uh, mental health, and then Pat refers them to the, pro the appropriate agency, social service, who gets them the care they need. The goal was actually before we would have used the judicial system. Well, the judicial system is not the best spot for these people to go. They need to get proper care, and this is what the social navigator does. 
Uh, since PATH came in, or we started the program, 84 people have gone through, have been referred to uh, the social navigator. Uh, right now, six people are active. And by active, that means PAD is actually working with them, trying to still connect them to the right agencies. 11 have actually been uh, connected to an agency, but they're still on the radar. We still need, because they're still there. It's not one of these things where if you refer a person to the agency, they may have been panhandling today, and tomorrow they're the teller that you're trying to make bank. It takes sometimes years. It's a slow process. But sometimes we have quick success. Sometimes it is. It's a housing issue or it's a financial issue. And once the connection is made, the person is gone. Uh, so right now, 11 people are really being monitored. Uh, seven people have outright declined to enter the program. And we actually, we're, we're going to have a different slide there. So now the courts are actually working with us. And we'll describe that later. 60 people have been discharged. But however, those 60 people, once they discharge, sometimes come back. Right? Sometimes you, they, they seem to be helped, they get the right meds, they're doing well, and then they come back. So, uh, this kind of shows you some of the, what the, these are 137 total navigations. Sometimes people are navigated to several different places. They could be getting a mental health assessment, plus they could get some income help. They could get some employment and mobility. But it just shows you the the variety of different agencies that the social navigator works with to connect the people to the right care. As a pilot project, which it is right now, and I have to really, uh, it's being funded right now by uh, economic development. Uh, the uh, EMS has given us the, uh, you know, Pat Doyle as a paramedic. Uh, but we need to find out if the program is actually working. The way it's being, it's an independent study done by the uh, City of Hamilton. They're going to survey through City of Hamilton Soft Pro all the social agencies that we've been working with. Uh, they're going to interview, they have questions set up for the clients that have been in the program. Uh, they're going to survey the action officers. And we had a grad student come in from uh, Laurier University who's working on her uh, master's in social work. She's actually gone through all the police reports involving uh, the people within the program which is hours and hours of work. I actually can give you some of the response, uh, the results of the grad students' work. Okay. But this is actually kind of fascinating too. Since I mentioned the people who are refusing to go into the program, what's our, what's our option? They go, up, they go into the judicial program. They go into, they go into court. Now the courts are actually re releasing people with the condition to respond to the social navigator. This is a first. So, Pat actually then takes these people, gets them connected, takes them to doctors, takes them to the appointments. Uh, since then, out of the five, we've had uh, two are still uh, in the process. Uh, one has been socially navigated, and two have long gone back to incarceration. The social navigator program does not replace arrest and enforcement. It is another option. And this is, you know, the clients who are they're given the chance, they go to, uh, they've been court opposed to go to, uh, work in the program. If they do not abide by it, they go back into the judicial system. Okay. We, this is a, uh, we're starting to, start to see some of the results. Uh, out of the 84 people who have gone successfully through the program, 49 of the clients have been out for six months. We needed something how to evaluate if there was an effect on criminal charges, mental health. So the grad student went through all the data and realizing that six months prior to, if you take all the people, the, the, the 49 clients, she took a snapshot on February 13th, six months prior to the, those clients going into the social navigator program, they committed a total of 63 criminal offenses. Six months after the same data, same people, they only committed 29 criminal offenses. So we're starting to see that the as it's going through the program, has reduced the making criminal offenses and relying on the judicial system. This one is fascinating. We didn't expect if we were going to get this result. Six months prior to, once again, they took all the mental health calls, which means these individuals were going to St. Joe's and being assessed and spending hours of officer time and medical time in emergency. 103 mental health calls. Since the, uh, the six months after, eight. And a lot of the reasons for this is because 
what happens is they get on the proper medication. They have workers, where before we had one client that would always say if they were going to kill themselves, then the police would have to take them to the uh, St. Joe's. But now they have a caseworker that works with them and says, no, don't take her to the hospital. I will look after her. Aggressive panhandling. Out of the clients that we had, uh, we had five of them that we classified as aggressive panhandlers. And that means they, they had at least five panhandling charges six months prior to going into the program. Uh, so the total, they had 145 tickets between the, the five of them. When they're in the program, they had 92. And coming out of the program, they had 23. These are kind of the day, the cumulative days. Basically what this will tell you, on an average, each panhandler got a ticket once every nine days before they went into the program. Upon leaving the program, they get a ticket once every 75 days. They're still panhandling sometimes, but the, the reliance for them to panhandle isn't what it used to be. Now, I've already talked about that the, the action strategy was part of the community development program, and these are stats that show you the changes in downtown, the economic growth of downtown. Is it a result of the action strategy? No, not at all. There's a lot of people working very hard to help turn the downtown around. Economic renewal has done, you know, the BIAs. We are just part of the strategy. Uh, since 2000, in 2011, uh, dwelling building permits went up 1,700%. Uh, capital investment was up 35%. Job uh, office vacancies went up 2.5%, but that's because there's more uh, offices being built. 330 jobs created and 35 businesses. This trend continued in 2012. And there's more people that the building permits are starting to live downtown. There's more capital investment coming downtown. This is, a, and this is a, the uh, value of all the, uh, the construction. In 2009, we had over $100,000 and or $100 million in construction. But that was publicly funded money. That was the library. That was City Hall. That was the farmer's market. That was the Lister Block. And this was that the city actually put money into the, the downtown to help renew it, hoping that the private sector would fall. And now you're starting to see it. In 2011, 2000, and, and 2012, that is 90% public or private money that's coming into the core. So there is a changing development. There's a changing at, uh, atmosphere of the downtown. And this is why the active strategy is actually, what was, or we showed you earlier, deploying downtown. Like Marty said, this weekend had, you know, Oprah, the Bulldogs, there was a convention, uh, that Beauty and the Beast was playing, uh, or Stephen Beauty was playing at Cox. You had the Food and Drink Festival. There's a lot going on. And this just shows you the difference in the, the building, these are the dwelling permits that are being issued for downtown. And actually, 2013 already is set, looks like it's going to break uh, 2012. So I'd like to thank you for uh, listening to our presentation, and we're, we'd like to have questions. Madam yeah. Chair, to uh, Scott and all of the people, including the chief uh, behind the action strategy, there is a uh, a ranking of cities that occurs every year from Money Sense Magazine, and for some reason the media didn't pick it up this year, but they have in the past two years. So what's happened out of 190 cities ranked, last year we were 77th of all Canadian cities. This year we're 63rd. We're up 14 places on that list. Burlington is second or third. They, they rank very highly on a number of categories. Um, the uh, the crime element of the of the rankings is uh, accounts for a certain percentage of it, and so there is a crime severity percentage that that they use from other sources. The chief will know that, and you will too, Scott. Uh, and that severity rate has, as we all know, we're we're improving in our policing. There are some other elements now that we have to improve on. And one of them is actually attracting more people to the city because it's a very high component of the ranking is, is a declining population or, or lack of increased population, which would show that the area is not doing very well and or has a perception from others of, oh, why do you want to move there? But it's interesting that Ward 2, the downtown ward, has had 
a significant increase in population, whereas some of the other lower city wards have actually lost population. So I only mention that, and as you said, uh, Scott, you can't say it's all because of the action team. Everybody's working hard to move the city ahead, but it is a part of it. And I would say the chief part from my time when I, I joined the council as the Ward 2 downtown councilor, and today is the presence of officers on the street. And I'll walk down James Street at 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, and I'll see officers patrolling, which I never saw in, in years gone by. So 77th on the list to 63rd on the list, and nowhere to go but up. So thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you. I'm not sure. I have uh, a couple questions. One of the questions I have is, uh, just for clarification, this is in the report, although it wasn't uh, presented. Uh, and I know we had this discussion at FCM. I sit on the, uh, the Safety Committee's uh, Committee for Federation Canadian Municipalities. <laughs> One of the things that's clear is that we don't necessarily accept the measurement that police are currently using in regards to uh, uh, defining uh, positive results. And, and we need uh, to create uh, something that's acceptable right across the, the spectrum. I'm going to give you an example that's in this report. In this report, one of the things that uh, the chiefs have cited in the past is crime severity is one of the, the areas that clearly <coughs> is one of those identifiable comparators that defines uh, to need to focus and, and, in fact, increase capacity within police services. So I look on page four of uh, this report. The level of serious is based on actual sentence handed down by courts in all provinces and territories. More serious crimes are assigned higher weights, and less serious offenses lower weights. As a result, more serious offenses have a greater impact on changes in the index. So the, 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 I guess the concern is, is that we know we have judges uh, right across the spectrum and then depending on the makeup of your judicial system within a community, you can have different levels of sentencing. And it doesn't have to be necessarily a severe crime. You could have it influenced by uh, a, a, a criminal <laughs> record or a first timer. And so there's no consistency in the judicial system and how they apply serious penalties to, to crimes. And yet that is part of the measurement for uh, crime, the, the crime severity index. So I just want to highlight that, that that is one of the discussions going on is that is that in all fairness from a methodology a true way to measure performance of uh, police services across the country now I know the chiefs probably uh, would disagree because they came up with it but or somebody came up with it, consultants whoever but certainly uh, uh, outsiders are looking at it and saying maybe perhaps we need to take a look and see if we can get an agreement on what is the best way to measure so I, I want to make that comment because a lot is weighted on, uh, on, on increasing police for, uh, services on crime, crime severity. So I just want to highlight that issue. The, uh, the other thing I was going to uh, mention is the, uh, one of the things they talk about in the uh, action report is these tactics all ensure high visibility and response to the... This is page nine. Thank you. These tactics all ensure high visibility and respond to the goal of improving the perception safety in neighborhoods. So I want to highlight perception for a moment. And in that, in, in that time, I'm going to uh, introduce these two pictures, Madam Chair. Uh, this is a 45 minute time lapse uh, witnessed by several individuals, including myself. Uh, and they were snapped. These are our action team members at uh, Mean and uh, Bay. And this is 45 minutes of officers uh, on, on their cycles uh, sitting at an intersection. So the question clearly becomes one when we talk about victimization. We talk about allocating resources appropriately to meet the, the growing needs of the service. One of the examples is, uh, is um, that being cited is the, uh, the, the fraud, the, the backlog of fraud cases. Uh, there's the example of child pornography. And, and by the way, this is just one example. Uh, we've been getting inundated with phone calls uh, and, and hearing from many aspects of the community that have identified similar uh, situations in regards to what they observe, because it's not hard to spot the yellow jackets. Then they clearly ask the question, wouldn't they be better uh, in some cases to meet the needs of the, the growing needs of this, these services in regards to child pornography uh, and uh, fraud? So I want to highlight that, because there's not just an example, but we've had a number of others that call in, and, and it's happening over the last 
number of months of what their obs observations are. And that's not including some of the input that uh, I personally received from some front line officers. So I guess the, the concern I have is, 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 is I have nothing to measure this against. So when you talk action, I notice that all the everything's action now, and I'm not sure if that is uh, done by design or if that's uh, because it really is. And when I look to the numbers, I thank you for the presentation. Great work. It does talk about the efforts of all police services within uh, the police services. Yet yeah, it's under the the, 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 the the title of action, so it really clouds the issue now. When I'm trying to, as a board member and, and certainly as a community, to try and measure the action team, and you talk about all the contacts it makes, and the intelligence, and the charges, but the charges all fold into the beat officers and, and the works of all the other divisions within the police services, so it's really hard to flush out uh, the, the success of one particular entity when it really it does fold into the, the broader uh, service, and, and it seems to me every presentation I get now, it's action, but really when you look at all the data, it's reflecting all police services, so I think it's a reflection of, of good work from all our, our, our men and women out the, on the front lines, not just the action. So I want to highlight that. Um, but it does beg the question when, when you see things like this, is there a more appropriate place that we can put some officers to meet uh, uh, and, and decrease, I think what the mayor had indicated before, victimization, to use the child pornography as an example. So I'm going to hit right back and say, is there capacity? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, actually, those photos, I like how you, you brought up, the action officers are easy to see in the yellow, yellow coats. That's correct. You, know, you talk about the perception of safety. That's also correct. To The perception of safety, to alleviate that, is actually police visibility. We actually have our officers between 3 and 5 stand at the corner of King and James. Because why? That's the rush hour time. 10,000 people will drive by that intersection at that time. They're also assisting with the traffic. But it really helps people say, you know what, there's police officers downtown. You know, it does stop the perception that, it, it, it eliminates the perception of being unsafe. That's what it is. It's hence what the, one of the values of the mounted unit is actually seeing the officers. People see the officers, it does say, I'm going to come downtown. Like, it, it's part of it. It really is. So the officer standing at King Bay, that's once again a very busy area. Yeah, and I, I think my, my point I'm making though is that my understanding is the, the, the onset of action and the expansion of action was to deal in high crime areas of crime. Uh, now, I'm now I'm hearing that uh, in this presentation that well, it's not just about crime; it's about presence, it's about uh, traffic, it's about uh, I mean I don't know how many tickets left hand tick legal left hand uh, tickets have been given or traffic violation tickets have been given up by the action team. But my understanding is there's a fair amount. Uh, so it's going beyond uh, what I had originally perceived the action team to be all about. And that was going after uh, uh, the, 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 the more severe crime and the violent crime uh, and get those numbers down. So um, I, I guess my point of, I'm trying to make is, is there capacity within the system? When we talk about the need on fraud and child pornography, and when we take a look at, at uh, the visibility, but uh, uh, not necessarily dealing with perception, but not necessarily dealing with crime. Is there a uh, capacity within the current complement to supplement those other areas that we've identified through the past presentations? The action strategy is clear that it relies, it goes into areas of high crime, which you know, Staff Sergeant Schulenberg showed you that the downtown area does have high crime, but it is, the strategy is very successful and it's based on high visibility officers on foot, not in cars, you know, engaging with the public. It, it, it's all part of reducing crime through, as you say, visibility, through interaction, through investigation. Like the, the stats that you gave us, like the stats we prevented are actually the arrests done by action officers. And you're quite correct. When we go to McQuest and, and we go to concession, it is really a partnership with the beat officers, with the crime managers, with the heat team. The action strategy is actually to supplement a lot of other policing initiatives. And that's why it makes it so valuable. And it's actually flexible. Like it says, we can move to different areas. You know? But it is the visibility 
that really is important for that part of the strategy. So I guess here's my challenge then. So uh, on the mouse, uh, I've, had many, I've had 22 community meetings in the last number of weeks. And one of the big issues I hear, and that Brenda Johnson, Councilor Johnson mentioned this as well, is that uh, you don't want to put officers in areas where there's not crime, which is fair, and everyone understands that. But yeah, we'll put officers to create a perception of safety in one area, but not necessarily use that same argument in other areas. So I, I guess there's a conflict. So if you've got uh, street pattern issues, speeding issues, running of stop sign issues, those kinds of things, well, they see those as issues within neighborhoods and other areas of the city. Yet the resources are going to high crime areas, but guess what they're doing, guys? They're doing a lot of that work too. Uh, traffic, stop running stop signs, and, and so forth. So those resources are, 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 are uh, increased in one area, not just to deal with, obviously, with, uh, uh, with crime and making contact, but still the traffic issues. And that's an issue uh, that I don't think downtown has monopoly on when it comes to uh, infractions or accidents. So I guess the issue, uh, the, and the, again, the concern is, if it's about perception, then I think we can make a, a strong argument that there's perception in many areas of this great city of ours that officers are needed. If it's about crime, then that's a separate argument. But when I see officers sitting for 45 minutes on, on a corner, and I'm hearing that child pornography, is a, uh, there's a shortage and there's an increase in, 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 in stats, I'm trying to understand where the priority is uh, relative to our resources. And I think that's a challenge that we have to convince the community, is how do you rationalize that? So I, maybe that's more of a comment, but uh, the, uh, yeah, th those, are the those are the comments and the questions and concerns. Uh, what I would like to see, though, at some point, I keep asking for benchmarking, even when we start this whole exercise, is I've never, ever seen uh, what our beat officers are doing. So the regional divisions, without the, minus the action team, well, how many contacts are they, have they made in a month or in a year? How many arrests are they uh, uh, providing? I don't see that breakdown. Uh, the other thing I don't see in this report is it doesn't identify a lot of the things the city's doing. For example, uh, the city's funding uh, cameras in uh, uh, many storefronts in the, within the BIAs. Uh, the, and we're talking on the sidewalk and so forth that provides additional tool for our police services, which you do identify in regards to the CCT and, and the utilization. But the other thing uh, it doesn't identify is the amount of investment the city's made on neighborhood development in the high-risk neighborhoods. And that is, you know, whether it's Beasley, Central Neighborhood, uh, uh, Keith Neighborhood, uh, all the high-risk neighborhoods, the city's been doing and putting a lot of resources to, to, to work with the community. And what happens when you get, as you, as you can appreciate, uh, a very uh, cohesive neighborhood, then obviously crime will go down because not only do you have intelligent uh, uh, reporting, but you have a, a community that uh, takes pride in their, their, their community and, and makes efforts, which also drives some of those, uh, <coughs> those, those trends down. And it's not mentioned here in, in the report, the contribution of those other issues. So um, I just wonder why. Chief Cash. Madam Chair, through you. The issue of crime and the perception of safety and actual safety are issues that have been intertwined for many, many years. It is not possible to separate those issues out. I can never tell you that those officers standing there for 45 minutes and the counselor hasn't provided the time of when they are so we can actually look into what the, yes, what the issue was. So we don't have the ability uh, at this point to look at that. But I can tell you there is no way for us to know how many uh, people were not robbed on the streets because the officers were there and their presence was, uh, was felt, was seen. I can't tell you how many banks weren't robbed. I can't tell you how many people didn't get shot. I can't tell you any of that. This police service is not about to start writing reports about what other agencies, boards, and commissions are doing in their areas. But we do know that our program is built on a strong strategy uh, with our community partners. Uh, we have worked very closely with uh, Paul Johnson with ec economic development. We've worked very closely with our community partners. And we continue to address the issues that are very, very key to all of us and we recognize the importance of, of those partnerships in making the strategy very, very successful. And our strategy is, is based on sound research, it's based on uh, uh, well-articulated uh, policing models. Uh, this is not something that is just born uh, uh, 
couple of years ago. This has been going on in the Hamilton Police Service for many, many years through the Neighborhood Safety Strategy. It's supplemented by the Ontario Crime Prevention uh, Framework that has been released most recently. It's supported by the Institute of Strategic International Studies uh, regarding full safety community, full circle community safety. Um, we are reaching out on many, many fronts to build those partnerships. At no time has the service ever sat here and said uh, that the service is responsible for everything great that is taking place. We are an important part of what takes place, and, it, and we have heard about the people having to be in the downtown core. Well, they're not going to come to the downtown core. They're not going to go to the restaurant. They're not going to go to any of the uh, facilities uh, for entertainment if they're not safe, and they don't perceive that they are safe. So it's just as important uh, to be a present at all these events to give people the confidence that the police are there. Yep. So we continue to have that framework in place. We continue to work uh, on this strategy. Uh, we continue to assess all areas of the city and where we need to be in the outer region. If this comes forward that violent crime is ri rising in those areas, then we will go to those areas. The Social Navigator Program is key because it is a concept built within policing, but I have to refer back to our local health integration network. And they have a, pro a program right now that is focused on the central health link and what the goal of the project is in our area. Uh, a population of about 150,000 people. There's approximately 320 individuals who are the top five cohort for both uh, hospital admission and emergency department visits. And in fact, the local in will tell us that 5% of those uh, people, the, that 320 cohort, actually consume about 66% of the healthcare dollars in our area. And the goal of the LIN project is to decrease hospital admission and emergency department visits among that top cohort. I have to tell you uh, right up front, this is not a police issue. This is not a police issue. But it is, every part of it is a police issue because as the inspector indicated, when we have apprehensions of 103 individuals under mental health uh, uh, situations that require care to look after their vulnerabilities. Uh, I think it's important that we provide that care, that we partner with St. Joe's, that we continue to work on this strategy. And when we can reduce it to eight people uh, afterwards, that's a very, very significant savings to the local health integrated network. It's a savings to those that actually need emergency services. Ours is a complex strategy and it is dependent on many partners and that's one of the ways that we are attempting to defer <coughs> strict costs associated to policing by involving other agencies. But it is a very successful program run by very talented people and dedicated officers out there every day who continue to deliver that service. So we're very proud of this strategy and we think that it's making a very positive and significant dent in crime in our area, in both real crime and the perceptual scene. Okay. Ivy? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to uh, Inspector Rasden, um, the Chief just addressed part of my question, because I was going to uh, just say that there's other large urban centers that I'm sure have the same challenges as Anakin, but we're doing something about it here. Um, what are the future uh, plans for a social navigator? Uh, once the independent evaluation has been completed, uh, we're going to the community services um, to look at a permanent funding for the program. Right now it's being funded through uh, economic renewal, so it's only a pilot project right now. Uh, like I said, we've had early successes. These are early stats that are coming through. So the whole evaluation will probably take another two months or so before we're ready to see if we really are making, if this will continue. Uh, we are very encouraged with, like I said, uh, some of the results are better than we anticipated. Uh, the action officers are extremely impressed with because they say, you know, we refer to people and then sometimes they're gone. Like they're, they're, they're where they should, they're getting proper care. So going forward, I think uh, this, I, we believe that has a lot of potential to be a permanent fixture in Hamilton. Uh, we may even start expanding the scope of referrals. Pat is only one person, and I tell you, he works very, very hard. Sometimes he has a bit of challenge keeping up, right? Uh, from there, you may see other agencies or other cities, urban cities, going, wow, look what Hamilton's doing. We might want to try that. But at least we'll have the model all set up for them. One more comment. Where do you, where's the referrals from? Are they just downtown or the other two areas that you're in? We actually do get some referrals from uh, the other divisions. Uh, but for the most part, uh, they do come from action. 
uh, there's more people, most there's more people in the downtown area that actually use the services. Uh, our goal is once again, if it does expand, then we have more ability to take more referrals from other people. But right now, Pat's uh, pretty well maxed out for what he gets. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Chair, I would just make a comment that uh, I certainly want to thank you for the report uh, today. And certainly, uh, I want to support the work of the action team. Uh, you know, I've been around here long enough now to, to tell you that we've had other action types of teams. And uh, the only comment that one comment that did bother me was when Marty's mentioned, and I maybe he can explain it to me later, that previous to this, it was inefficient. But, you know, I think I think this action team is doing a job for us today, and, and probably in, and in view of the larger picture, which obviously may be on some of our minds, it's a matter of getting this done along with all the other things at a, at a, at a, at a rate that we can all afford. So I think that this is wonderful. The, the, the biggest piece of this is uh, is the navigator program. I, mean, I, I think that in the past it's tied up so much resource. Uh, you know, not not not. I can recall many times going by the hospitals and just seeing five and six cruisers tied up in, in terms of, of, of officers being tied up. And I, I know that even when we give out a lot of tickets downtown in the past, uh, the tickets were just going in the wastebasket anyway because most of those people. Uh, had no intention, nor would, would we spend, or would we be able to spend the amount of time to change. So it's a very good strategic move to try to, 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 to work in a productive way to get people streamed as well as make our officers' efforts uh, uh, pay some dividends in, in, a, in a whole number of ways rather than just issuing uh, POA. So I think that's that's a big, I think a big improvement when you when you look at the improvements in that, that area. But I, I, I think it's important to to recognize today, like I know I just heard Council uh, Member uh, Station mentioned that other communities uh, must be, uh, must, uh, you know, will look to us. Well, I mean, other communities are doing various programs. We've been pleased with here around here with heat programs, and I haven't met a chief yet that hasn't had a program. That, uh, and we've had statistics that have been spent so many ways. I mean, I've seen engines built here that not rebuilt. And, you know, and, and listen to people tell me how on each, at each event how they were, the, it was the best thing to do at that particular time. I think this is doing the job, and, and for me, it's it's doing a good job, and I think we should see it as such. It's a question again, Madam Chair, I think of, of coming back, and you know, I think a few of us have uh, the bigger picture in our mind as well, and, and I'm not about to pick on action or anything of that nature. I think it's doing a good, good job of need to, for me into the bigger picture and, and somehow make it all work. So I want to salute the work uh, that's uh, been put before us today and certainly continue to work with this board to uh, to, uh, to find ways to get everything done within the limits that we were able to uh, survive. And, and you know, this is one model. The, we were at, uh, I think this morning when I was at the audit committee, uh, it was interesting because we were looking at succession models. And somebody threw up, I think it was Chris Murray, who I have a great deal of respect for threw up a model, but you know it's one model, and then you have 20 models if, you, if you've studied enough about this stuff, there's 20 models, uh, and you can give it whatever acronym you want, but uh, it all is directed, I think as the Chief has just outlined, is, is to arrive at a strategy to, to, to solve the issues and the needs that we, we spend a lot of time researching to define. So that makes perfect sense to me. Again, it becomes a question of, uh, and the statistics that we produce, I've seen enough statistics that I can spin them any way you want, and I can tell you that I think, though, generally, people in this community see it moving in the right direction. And I think that people are feeling better about downtown, feeling better about this community. It sees the change underway in terms of industry is shrinking. Uh, we have new technology and new types of, of businesses coming here and new groups of people. So I think that uh, that, that spirit is uh, upon us, and I'm more than happy to see today's report. Thank you. Um, hearing, hearing the uh, responses around the table through you, Madam Chair, I think this is uh, intelligent led by policing. We had a strategy in place. We took, we had a function that uh, the chief had a vision of, of implementing the strategy. It was a function. We put our resources toward it, and we're seeing the results of that. What we're hearing also is other communities. I, I, I spent some time speaking with, I know Boston just had a 
terrible incident that just happened with the bonds, but I spoke with theirs around their new budget moving forward 2013. I spoke with Chicago also. All of them are focusing on the same thing. Community policing, strategic, more collaboratives. We are ahead of the curve on that. We just won an award. I was just at a conference when we won an award around the strategies. The focused resources in addressing these issues. And I have to say that seeing what we're doing here and the numbers that you've presented is, is extremely encouraging. Whether or not we were doing things ineffectively in the future, we are addressing how we can be, take our functions and use our resources more effectively and reducing. I was speaking with people off our con concession. They're head over heels excited about what the revitalization is up there. I've spoken with other community leaders around the collaboratives that we're putting together and what's, it, what's wonderful about what we're seeing in the Social Navigator program of working together collaboratively. So uh, I can see that we are a true partner in working with our, with our partnerships across the city and seeing that economic development is increasing and that we play a very important role in that. So, Thank you for this report. It was a sterling report. And other, other urban cities are looking to do absolutely the same thing, but now in 2013. Yes, Madam Chair, just on the perception, there's a lady who uh, came from Windsor to one of the concerts at, at COPS uh, who was staying at the Sheraton. And she was actually born and grew, grew up in Hamilton but had been out of town for years. She insisted that she had to take a cab from a restaurant on the south side of King Street by Gore Park back to the Sheraton because there's no way she was going to walk back to the Sheraton from the south side. So that was her perception based on years gone by. Now I can tell you when I became the War II counselor, from King and James East was an open drug market and I made a, a citizen's arrest once on one individual who was smashing a phone, uh, that uh, one of the public phones. On another occasion, I was being harassed by someone who was yelling out loud and, and obviously doing those noisy signals that drug dealers do to one another. And when I confronted him, he basically threatened me. So I called 911. So for the next day or two, there was a police presence that I hadn't seen before, and the whole street went quiet. And then two days later, they were all back again. In the corner of King and James is a, a window to the city of Hamilton, and those stairs that go up to the plaza were always plastered with, well, it was a lack of public order. And when the action team came, it changed. And it's noticeably changed, and it's a real change, and it's not a perceived change, and it's better. But if you take those officers away, they'll come right back. So everything that's uh, put forward, was, uh, I've been there, and I think they're doing a great job, and I appreciate it. And Inspector Raston will know, we talked about putting a traffic officer at King and James on a little podium with white gloves, not to move the traffic, but to keep the people who were causing public disorder on the, on the plaza stairs out of there. And you come up with a better idea, so thank you. Thank you very much for the report. Can we have a motion to approve? <coughs> Ivy, Bernie, thank you. Pride Award. Madam Chair. I must tell you that when the philosophy was being built, 
and we were embarking on this, one of the people that we had the first opportunity to sit down and discuss this with, when we got to the social navigating component, uh, we had offered, we had operated our own pilot project. The challenge in the police operating the social navigator component is whenever we entered into a discussion with people about the care of individuals, it was the police that were having the conversation and the discussion was often about who's going to get arrested, who's going to get charged, who's going to go to jail. Uh, what we did discover, although excellent work was being done, is we needed to change that dialogue from policing to the circle of care for those individuals that required our service the most and that present with those vulnerabilities in our communities and require the support and the services. I had an opportunity to speak with Brent about the ability to change the focus of that discussion uh, by having the social navigator actually be a uh, non-police person and we came up with the strategy uh, of utilizing uh, paramedic as the circle of care discussion uh, which we have now seen it completely changes the way that we're able to provide service uh, to, to those folks that need that. So I want to offer uh, my personal thank you to Brent for his leadership in getting the program really off the ground. He was, uh, he was instrumental in this phase in acquiring funding and working with our community partners and working with, uh, working with the city agencies, working with Paul, Paul Johnson, uh, working with economic development and presenting, in fact, the funding model. Uh, securing the funding, but also building into that the performance measurement metrics for the success of the program. Uh, he has been instrumental in working with our communication strategy and getting the message out. He was involved in the selection and, uh, and recruiting, and in fact, uh, the individual that was selected coming from his staff that has really helped us to move the uh, program forward. So, uh, Brent, on behalf of our service, on behalf of the community, on behalf of those that consume the services of the Social Navigator, I want to thank you for your commitment, your leadership, and your guidance in the project. Uh, we are where we are today because of your efforts, so congratulations. Poverty, but I grew up in a loving family. 
it reminded me when I listened to this story about my mom baking bread. And there's various ingredients in terms of baking bread. And if you miss any one of those ingredients, the bread's not going to turn out so well. It might be edible, and if you're living in poverty, you're going to eat what comes out of that oven. But if you forget the yeast, the bread's not going to rise. Again, you'll still eat it. But so when you reflect on where we've been as a community and what I've observed on the street and in the office over the last 33 years, I'd suggest what we've done is we've taken that bread from where we couldn't afford all the ingredients on our house up on East 39th all the time. And we've added up all the ingredients. The social navigator is one of those ingredients. The action team is another one of those ingredients. The police officers, the local health integrated network that's adding a number of ingredients. Then the hospitals that are now adding ingredients in terms of community focus, not just the institutional care the family practice unit, community services, public works, the paramedic service, and the many other services and agencies, community agencies, that are all partnering with the Hamilton Police Services. They're certainly behind all these documents. And collectively, we're baking some awesome bread that when you open up the door and you come home from school, your children can smell that great bread and they can feel safe in this community. So that's what all these projects for me remind me of. And if any one of those ingredients missed, you're still going to eat bread, we'll still continue on. But I think with the courage of the police chief, the courage of all of us as community leaders and community workers, we're breaking some awesome bread and we're going to make it even better in the future. Incident may have six there, and an incident could be at a um, 
a church, it could be at a mosque, it could be at uh, a place where uh, a person identified under um, the, the categories that I'm going to go through in a bit. It's for us to see a reoccurrence of that event. So if something happened at the church, the motivation is ambiguous. We have no uh, idea where the motivation is coming from, but it, to us it could signal a reoccurrence. So an event that could happen or could show up the next next year, say, and it has some overtones, we now have some evidence to support a further charge if we get that far. Um, just to break down those 161 events, this is what uh, the events have broken down. We have 112 <coughs> events in the race or ethnicity. We have 31 events regarding religion. We have 16 events regarding sexual orientation and two uh, disability. And these stats are consistent with the hate crime stats from Canada in, in terms of those three uh, events are consistent though that, with that portion. The next slide, just to break that down further, the greatest number of reported events was in the race and ethnicity. And it's further broken down in the black community statistically the most targeted as well with 49 events and that goes along with the Stats Canada report as well. And the second most targeted group statistically is categorized under religion, in particular the Jewish community. And in, the, in that category, 25 events, the majority of those events are um, mischief graffiti. The third targeted group is based on sexual orientation with 16 events. So when I spoke about the 16 total reported events classified as a hate by its motivated crime, so the motivation was established to go forward through the courts, um, last year we had 54, and this year we have 16. It does show a decrease, however, I'd just like to explain the decrease, and the decrease is the Hamilton Police, we've done a fine tuning in our reporting system. So uh, we have looked at how we capture uh, the hate crime reports within the reporting system. And we have uh, fine-tuned it so that we have each uh, category capturing the, uh, the motivation. If the motivation is unclear or ambiguous, we, have a, we then cannot capture it as a hate crime. It moves into the second category. And that's where you see uh, the chart from 2007 to 2012, classifications of hate bias, motivated crimes, where we're down to 16. We still uh, investigate all um, incidents with due diligence and uh, take each incident seriously. This is the overall uh, hate bias incident. So we had uh, 16 hate crimes in yellow with 145 incidents. Our incidents have increased slightly um, compared to last year at 126. Um, some of the highlights that uh, I'd just like to um, pass on to you is that uh, the attended events that uh, I go to um, within the community, we went to the Forgotten Genocide presentation with the Roma community, the International Day of Holocaust for Remembrance, an international day against homophobia, biphobia, transphobia. These are all valuable contexts which our unit is, is constantly um, trying to engage the community and encourage reporting and have a basic language on talking about hate crime. Um, I'm also working with the, the acronym there, HCEIT, is the Hate Crime Extremism Investigative Team, team which is a multi-jurisdictional team and the OPC at the Ontario Police College in developing further education um, around hate crime. That's not only educating the community, but also educating our officers um, and myself on what hate crimes uh, look like and how we can assist the victims and work the uh, cases through the board. I thank you for your time. I know it was short and sweet. And, uh, <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Uh, again, uh, I would like to commend, uh, I mean, this is a, a serious area that uh, might think needs to be zero tolerance. And so uh, I'm glad that we have this unit that's doing the work it's, it's doing. Uh, the question
question I was going to ask, or is asking, is uh, uh, there's been reports of some uh, more racist or edgy organizations coming in from Europe and Montreal, I think is dealing with it now. Uh, have we seen any of that kind of, I can't remember what the organization's called, but it's, it's, it's an anti-Semitic uh, organization. Are we seeing anything like that evolving here? Are, have we watched your websites, for example, on, on that kind of uh, material as well? The uh, hate crime uh, extremism and investigative team is a valuable tool that uh, the unit uh, liaises with uh, members from all across the province. <coughs> And those dot, that's the dialogue we have. What, see, what are we seeing? Um, is anyone seeing something different? How can we use that information? We all have to be aware of what's going on. And that, that is a great opportunity uh, for uh, our unit to, to do that. And are we seeing here in Hamilton? Uh, we're aware of what goes on around in, in all of the provinces and are continually um, monitoring what we can um, to and will actively investigate if we do have incidents. Right, so currently we have no uh, um, <coughs> knowledge of, of an act of cell or one of these anti or discriminatory or whatever uh, organizations uh, being located in the city of Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Deputy. Sorry, Nancy. You're quite right, context has changed. How they set up, it's extremely mobile. You may have people from different countries aligned. So they have old uh, Ernest Sundle type of uh, hate crime group. is isn't as prevalent anymore. That doesn't mean they're not as active. And, uh, tend to hide out in the internet a little more. We did have stage years back where there was active recruiting going on in high school. Um, so we're certainly cognizant of that, both through hate crime investigators, but also our intelligence section. So when those pop up, we certainly address them when you're advocating genocide or hate crimes. <laughs> uh, but it's a broader context, quite right, it's changed the fluidity, uh, much like youth gangs or gangs in general. They expand and collapse uh, very quickly now. Uh, but we're certainly tuned to it. We keep our eyes open, both from a terrorist aspect, but also the hate crime aspect, and large that stuff for intelligence in concert with the hate crime Appreciate that. Thank you very much, Kristen. And so to piggyback on uh, what, what comment that was made by Terry, this, this card that I have in front of me was um, it's called the New Order. It's got a Nazi and city on it. Uh, building a Better World for Future Aryan Generations. It was found in a library book in, in Dundas. Um, the woman had taken out the book to look at the Holocaust, and this was in the book. Speaking with the library as well, and with the hate crimes unit, she had spoken um, with the unit around that these are, this isn't the first time that this is aware. So there is this kind of um, activity. Uh, it is difficult to pinpoint these kinds of things. So that that is a concern that just like what we saw in, in London now with these, these poor young lads who were led astray and ended up, you know, in a, in a compound in Morocco beds. Um, so that that is, I'd like, you know, just to address just this particular, you know, sort of incident piggybacking on what, what Tara said, and I just have another question. So, you know, what do you see as, through you, Madam Chair, to uh, Nancy, or to you, Eric, you know, what, what do you see this as uh, just mischief, or is it something more? Through you, Madam Chair, it's not just mischief. We have um, we take all um, investigations seriously, and the victims that that it harms. It just doesn't harm one person. It, it affects the whole community. So having those relationships with the community to say, bring more information. You're right. It's a card. We, you're limited on where you can go with that investigation. However, if we are all talking about it, then everyone's awareness is. We open up everyone's awareness so that we can have. <coughs> Uh, more information to go on. And it doesn't just stop there. It's continually talking with my partners across the province to find out is there anything that we should be aware of and, and we should be very seriously. I'm encouraged by the fact is that, you know, in terms of, so graffiti um, it is up in terms of its reporting. Um, are people more coming? Last year we were very encouraged. I think the statement was that we have seen more people coming forward and reporting it. 
do you see this year perhaps that that that's down that people hear that whether or not and we know that level of bringing it as a criminal case is, is a difficult benchmark that people sort of feel okay we're, we're what, where is it going to go if we report it? Is it going to be taken as a, you know, to the next uh, step in terms of being brought as a, as a case? So I'm encouraged by, you know, by these numbers that perhaps, you know, paid incidents are down. But, you know, again, I'm seeing a target against, a larger target against the, the Jewish community has increased from last year. Um, and against the, the black community, I'm seeing the violence hasn't diminished in terms of sexual orientation. That's a real deep concern to me, but they are the victimization of, of assaults. The other thing, and I know these are a number of questions, but the sexual assault, which is new, that appeared on this, I, I believe, I because I, I have the report from last year, um, that some of them are down on a zero. So these are the kinds of things where I'm seeing. So I'd like to have you address that about reporting. Are you hearing a level of frustration maybe now emerging? Is that a trend? And then some of those other incidences. Uh, I'm not sure it's a level uh, of, of frustration. Um, the, the benchmark is high. You have to have proof motivation. Motivation is very difficult to prove. Um, but I, I am encouraging uh, and have that dialogue with the victims. Um, to assist them through the process, a very intimidating process, to assist them through the process. We have victim services plus vic uh, victim witness assistance program through the courts that we utilize and encourage our victims to get through the court system. And I attend every, every appearance at court to ensure that we are at court um, and Section 718 for aggravating uh, factors to increase the sentence because it's a hate crime, I ensure that it's done. It sends a message so that please, you know, report. We will take it seriously and, and assist you through that process. Um, I, I am encouraged if constant communication that we can, we can have a greater success in the uh, court process. I answered your question. We have a motion to approve the report, Bernie. Terry, thank you. Thank you very much for your work. Do we have any declarations of interest? Hearing none. Can we have an approval of the consent check on the agenda, please? Bernie? Discussion agenda. Chair, members of the uh, board, item 5.1D in relation to the police budget. The item in the agenda is made up of the motion of council from April the 3rd and finalized on April the 10th and the attached board report. <coughs> the Hamilton Police Service has prepared the budget estimates of the board and through a lengthy process of review, the board approved the 2013 <coughs> operating budget at 3.71%. This board must be acknowledged for the hard work and the diligence in the extensive, thorough, and publicly transparent process. The board has approved the budget with a commitment to staffing increase of 20 officers and one civilian stenographer. The crime analysis project designed to assist in strategic deployment of officers. An HRIS project which will drive cost savings and efficiencies through the development of e-scheduling of officers. The development of a time and resource management program, the commencement of the online citizen reporting tool project, and it allows us to start the process of network switch upgrades in order to cut the cost of established phone lines by upwards of half a million dollars in the future and implementing a VoIP system. The budget was advanced as response to City Council. The Police Services Act provides authority for Council to approve, reject, or set the budget for policing in the municipality. The Council does not have any authority to approve or disapprove any specific item in the budget's approved budget, nor does Council have authority to direct this Board how or where to allocate the funding. On April the 3rd, 2013, Council made the decision to establish the budget at 3.52%. Council has chosen to exercise its authority in law. 
The position was confirmed on April the 10th, 2013, when Council approved the citywide budget with the GIC approval. The responsibility of this board is now to accept the decision of Council or to make application to the Ontario Civilian and Police Commission for review. It is the recommendation of the service that the board accept the decision of Council. The decision will prevent the expenditure of public policing dollars on a legal appeal process to the Commission while strongly adhering to the Board's decision and commitment to new officers in support of public safety and service delivery maintenance. We are thankful for the financial support of our citizens and we remain committed to spend every available tax dollar on policing and not on legal battles. This budget has been and always will be about the safety of the public and the maintenance of service delivery. We remain committed as a service to provide the public safety to the, to the best of our ability within the established budget. We have come a long way in this process. The initial budget was established at 6.28% and we have reduced that to the board approved 3.71. The difference between the board approval 3.71 and the council approved 3.52 is $261,000. If the board approves the recommendation to accept the council approved budget, the Hamilton Police Service will hire 15 officers and one civilian, and we will commence each of the projects designed for future cost reduction, cost avoidance, and savings. The hiring of personnel has been, and it remains the top priority of this budget in support of public safety and the safety of our officers. We have never wavered in our position as our top budgetary priority, and we remain committed to the board in this decision. We continue to assess the ever-changing and dynamic environments that we work in. We have clearly articulated and demonstrated the increased demand for service, increased time required to complete calls for service, established standards of policing, increasing population, a continued high crime severity index and low ratio of officers to population as compared to other jurisdictions. We have presented a very sound business case and a business strategy that has not been refuted. The new officers will be hired in September. We will deploy five officers in Division 2, five officers in Division 3 directly to the front line where their presence will be immediately felt through high visibility <coughs> patrol enforcement and they will contrib contribute to the public safety and maintenance of response times, service standards, and service delivery. The staffing increase is essential in light of the additional 36,000 hours of additional time that is required to complete the 80,000 calls for service and this is also faced amongst the increasing population. The impact of the 2013 budget is 767,000 or 0.57 and the annualized costs of the new hires will be $1.15 million. Five officers will fill critical investigative positions, which will contribute to public safety, recognizing the significant risk in monitoring of sexual offenders and supporting our strategic offender management strategy. We have combined functions to support the sex offender registry management, which is a critical step to protect victims of sexual abuse and child exploitation. Child exploitation and technical investigations continue to expand in quantity, magnitude, and complexity, and two officers will be assigned. Finally, we have just completed the ministry inspection and an analysis of missing persons procedures, and we have determined that a missing persons coordinator is required. We have been running this position as a pilot, and I must point out, this critical position in the organization has now also been identified in the recent Justice Upal report entitled Forsaken, dealing with missing and murdered Aboriginal women in British Columbia. We accept and we implement the recommendation for the citizens of Hamilton. We will for formalize our polygraph examiner position in support of the heavy caseload of criminal investigations that require this support. Keeping in mind the legislated requirement for adequate and effective policing services and our request for 20 officers, it is now not possible as a result of the decision of council to fill all of the positions that we had identified. As such, we will not supplement our breathalyzer officers to cover the operational requirement to have them available 24 hours 
This, within the context of the last two years of rising incidents of impaired driving representing a risk to the service, which we will mitigate through alternative ways. We also will not establish the traffic enforcement team within support services as we had planned. There will be an associated loss of enforcement that the officers would have provided and the loss of impact to traffic safety. The Hamilton Police Service over the last five years have clearly demonstrated a strong relationship between enforcement and collision reduction. In order to meet the Council's 3.52%, we have eliminated joint job review funding. Any grievances moving forward in 2013 for joint job review will present as unfunded liabilities. Also taking the direction of council, the contribution from reserves has been reversed and we have removed the contribution for capital financing. The board has remained focused on staffing as the priority and that has not changed and we will work to maintain the service delivery levels to the citizens and work to secure the safety of our officers. The service will review our structure and our job functions with inadequacy standards legislation and we will continue to look to find additional efficiencies and savings by assessing the jobs and the functions to determine what work the service should no longer perform and identify future savings. We will continue to advance the cost avoidance and cost savings projects like the St. Joe, St. Joe's Mental Health Protocol, our Case Preparation Unit, our niche enhancements property module, our shift schedule pilot project, and our court security review. If the budget recommendation is approved by this board, the operational budget process for 2013 is complete. And we recognize and we respect the oversight and governance of this board, and we thank the council for the diligence of the process, which must always remain respectful of the legislative requirements and the boundaries as established within the Police Services Act. If approved, the focus will now change to the current collective agreement bargaining and we know that the police budget is almost 90% salaries and benefits. The service does not negotiate the collective agreement. The negotiation is between the board and the association and that process will take place shortly. However, as identified in the budget presentations, what happens at the bargaining table will impact the future operating budgets. Members of the board, I specifically want to thank those who have put forth a great deal of effort on the budget process. Deputy Chief Leindert, Deputy Chief Gert, Catherine Martin, Marco Byzantini, Mike Shea, Rita Lee Irvine, and Debbie Gifford. Gifford. All of this would not have been possible without the efforts of our finance department, Ted Mason, supported by John Randazzo, and a special note of appreciation goes to each of those individuals for their assistance. I want to recognize all of the members of our service they have performed beyond levels of expectation with over a 50% increase in enforcement over the last four years resulting in the lowest number of collisions in the last 19 years. They continue to respond to the 80,000 calls for service annually. Our members dedicate their entire adult professional life to the service of others, most often for people they do not even know. Our civilians and officers have embraced community-based policing and preventative programs which are producing significant crime reductions and support for our young people in the community. We care for and we support sexual assault victims, robbery victims. We hold the hands of missing children when they, we are reuniting them with their parents. We deliver the worst possible news regarding loved ones involved in drinking and driving collisions and we work daily to protect women and children from domestic violence and sexual abuse. Our officers and civilians are doing amazing work in difficult circumstances, and they earn and they deserve our respect. The men and women of this service, civilian and sworn, have the complete confidence and the respect of the entire command of this service. Those are my comments, Madam Chair. Uh, and Chief, thank you for that. I'm, I'm really pleased that we can meet the Council's budgetary objective in terms of dollars, but I'm also very pleased that we, we don't step back from the increase in the complement. Uh, but what I, I don't understand right now, uh, what are the implications, what would they be of, of, uh, of uh, an appeal to OCOPS and, and the, the funding that might be required? Through you, Madam Chair. Sure. I believe uh, an appeal to OCOPS could hover around the 300,000 mark, but perhaps the chief can uh, uh, take Chair, uh, through you to the mayor. 
Uh, the chair is correct. It's anticipated that the deal to the commission would be somewhere in the neighborhood of an estimated three hundred thousand dollars. And the service does not recommend uh, that we expend taxpayers' money on the legal process. That those dollars, any dollars that are dedicated to policing, be spent on policing. So at three hundred thousand dollars. It must be also remembered that both the service legal fees and the legal fees of the city, council's legal fees, uh, it's the taxpayer that is on the hook for both components to pay both sides of the same argument. And in fact, we believe that that is in fact one of the major factors we've considered and it's unfair to the taxpayer. Uh, I believe the board has a very, very strong case that will go to the commission if that was the requirement. And I believe that once presented, uh, there is also a strong likelihood that the commission, faced with the evidence of the business case that we have presented, may in fact make an order uh, a greater than what is being requested by the service. And the order, we know, once given by the commission, uh, is not subject of appeal. It does not come back to this board. It does not come back to council for approval. It is an order of the commission, and it must be complied with. Uh, not, there is not, to my knowledge, an appeal process within the statute. So it, in fact, would mean the potential of even a greater burden for the taxpayers. So we know that what we want to do, what we have done, is take a very measured, reasonable, and strategic approach to this. This board has been fully engaged uh, and has evaluated all of the risks confronting the citizens of Hamilton, has conducted a full analysis of the avalanche of research that has been and we believe that this is, in fact, a major Hamilton solution, a strategic plan that is committed to public safety. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, uh, I, uh, I woke up this morning and uh, after reading the uh, report on the weekend, and remember looking at my children and, and, and talked about debts and loans and ability to pay, uh, and kids want everything, as you know, and, and you have to control their expectations. And in that discussion, uh, I remember talking about, as a counselor, because you know, Chantel always looks at me and says, Dad, you know, why do you do what you do? And, uh, and obviously, I uh, get the standard path, you want to make it a better world. The issue for me is I don't want my kids saddled with legacy costs. Legacy costs that uh, my forefathers created for me, and now I'm responsible in the context of my children moving forward. I want an affordable community that people can live in safely, but can afford to live. When you take a look at a police services budget, that uh, chair that's increased from $80 million in 2000 to over $142 million today, that's just not sustainable. And the reality is, is that we have my rate process spectrum going down. We hired 82 officers since 2000 in this community. And it's clear that uh, the, the officers are exceeding and are punching above their weight. And that is a testimony to the training, the frontline officers and the management, ensuring that we have the right people in the right place. And I'm proud of that. And that's, again, a testimony to our frontline officers. The issue, though, uh, Madam Chair, is when you take a look at a, a report that is provided, supported by this council, or sorry, by this board, and that is the proactive and reactive. The actual recommendations, if you recall, was 50-50. Careful what you ask for. That was a recommendation. We actually exceeded that and accepted a 60-40, which was the best practice. And that, that standard, fact has an impact in regards to how you deliver the service. And in the same report, Madam Chair, the same report, it said the services are dependent on people's ability to pay. Yet there was no assessment, Madam Chair, anywhere on the community's ability to pay. When I look around this table, I see individuals that do okay for themselves financially. But there's many out there that are not in the same situation. So often when I think about making decisions, I think about the people that have less than I, that struggle day to day, making minimum wage or just got laid off and relying on their severance, trying to keep in their, stay in their homes. I think the same way at council, 
in regards to the budgets as I, I, I do here, and that is to try and get make sure we have value, and I think the team, for that perspective, has done a wonderful job. And past chiefs, get value for it all. That's the number one thing the taxpayer asks for. But number two, make it affordable. Make it affordable and not beyond the means of people to live in this community that don't have the means or the wage or the income to stay in their homes. We have a high pop senior population in Ontario. A lot of our seniors, a lot of them are doing okay. And there's a lot that do not do okay. There's a lot on fixed incomes, fixed, uh, fixed pensions. And we know that seniors do better when they stay in their homes as opposed to being institutionalized in Ontario. We know that, and I hear from in Ward 8, for example, there's more seniors per capita in Ward 8 than anywhere else in the city. I hear loud and clear from seniors. Terry, Councillor, how in the heck am I going to stay in my home next year if you continue increasing the taxes the way you do? So they become very skeptical. You know the funny thing, for the first time in my history, in history as, a, uh, as elected official, even as a chief of staff in the mayor's office, I've never seen an outcry from the community that I've received in the last number of months. Never, ever seen where the community came forward and said, and I've always supported police service budgets that it's got to come to a halt. We have to start pushing back on police service budgets because it's now getting to the point it's not affordable. Like I indicated, 2008 to, uh, to today, overall city budget increased by 13%. The police services budget increased by 20.6%. Yes, I understand that wages and salaries is the significant contributor to that. I know that we got negotiations coming up and we'll do the best we can to hold the line. We also know that we don't have any control of interest arbitration and we know that the interest arbitration often sets the pattern to maintain the status of police services in Hamilton where they are relative to all our competitors in Ontario. We know that's what we're up against and what's really I find uh, tough to, to understand and, 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 and articulate to my communities and taxpayers of this, uh, this community is how the relevance of maintaining a position is, is, is more important than the individual circumstances of a community. Our community services, which I chair the committee, and our finance people have clearly indicated that in Hamilton we have a unique situation. We are a regional center, Madam Chair. We have for mental health and uh, for many specialties in our hospitals. We're, we, we are number two uh, uh, a stop off for refugees and immigration. We have a lot of burdens that taxpayers, property taxpayers, are taking on. Police service is just one of them. So when we go to our general managers and look them in the face and say, look, year to year to year, which they've delivered, you have to come in as zero, uh, close to zero as possible. And I can bet you five dollars that each of those general managers are taking that direction seriously. And for most part, they deliver. And that's reflective in a 0.8, 0.9%, and a 1.9% by council. So the challenge I have, Madam Chair, with this particular increase, and that's why I had the dilemma this morning, is that I guess one of my, 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 my concerns with, it, with the, the, the whole, this whole process is the, how intringent, how, how, how the line sort of was drawn and, and there was no room for compromise. And that wasn't all that appealing to me. I mean, often when you're talking in, in, in a governance position, you look for the compromise, you look for the middle ground, you look for a solution. And it didn't appear that there was any way that we were going to get there. And I saw this and I saw, okay, well, well we got now $380,000, $83,000 in savings. Uh, we don't have to spend legal costs in going to old cops. All positive things. Uh, but we're still hiring 15 officers and one civilian. I guess my concern there is that that's going to have a 0.85% increase impact on an annualized basis in 2014. That's not including what may be negotiated in the police services budget. Could be 3% if that, if that was the going rate. So now you're looking at right from the get-go, 3.85. Now, there may be efficiencies found or there may be more pressures. We know gas is 
going up, you know, oil is going up, you know, electricity is going up, you know, a lot of things are going up, and those impacts and those pressures will come to bear. So it's like a moving target. We try to find efficiencies, but at the same time, we have growth in, in, in costs and pressures. So when I take all those considerations, I want to put my hats off to the, the chief for coming forward and making the recommendation he is. Uh, I really appreciate it, all, all sincerity. My issue has always been about affordability and the lack of that process here at this board. The lack of any research and study to understand what this community can afford. There just seems to be an assumption because that's what Peel did. That's what York did. Hamilton can do it. Well, we're not York, we're not Peel. We have our own unique circumstances, Hamilton. We have our own identity and we have a lot of poor. And we have a lot of people that are just barely holding on to their homes. And we have a lot of people that do not make over $40,000 in the total household income from the year. So every time you have a police service budget now represents number two on the, on the a ranking of taxes, that's that, that much closer to losing their home. That concerns me. And I take that uh, as a serious issue. And when I look at council's, the spirit of council's motion, it was pretty clear, abundantly clear for the majority and some didn't want it to zero, which I thought was impractical. No question it was impractical. 352 I thought was a reasonable uh, budget, and then there was a lot of whereases. and yes, the police chief is right. Our responsibility as a council is to drive what that target is, not to get into the operational issues. I understand and appreciate that. But the spirit, as a board member sitting here now, the spirit of what was being asked, I can now articulate as a board member is still there. And this doesn't meet the spirit because what in fact it does is puts an additional burden in 2014 on the taxpayers of this community. One that may be over 4%. And that concerns me. And I thought I, I have to respond finally, Madam Chair. When I hear about the, the, the commission and that, yes, we're, we would win it, we could even win it and be go higher. Well, I want to let you know something. The also, the also alternative is true. The commission will lower. And from my perspective as a councillor, we have nothing to lose. Because as a council, you're there to try and manage as best you can finances for the taxpayers of this community. But I think this board has everything to lose. Because if you go to the commission, the commission agrees with council, then all the credibility is out the window. The council doesn't uh, uh, sides with the services, but hey, council is trying to control costs. So I think it is a dangerous game when you think about going to uh, to, uh, to the commission. I respect uh, the chief's recommendation before us. However, I, uh, I appreciate the thought that went to it. I, I appreciate the fact that we do not want to be spending taxpayers' money fighting each other. But at the end of the day, my children will have a bill to pay. I'm going to try and keep that bill as low as I practically can. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, actually, when you leave. Well, no, I, 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 I'm going to try not to repeat some of the things that have been said. Madam Chair, already, uh, by Terry, as I cut to the chase, I won't be supporting uh, Chief's recommendation today. I appreciate again the litany of rules and regulations and procedures and justifications. And I want to salute that. I think what I need to convey very clearly to the service and to you, Madam Chair, is that the council understands fully all the rules and regulations 393. And, and that's really not what this is all about. In fact, I want to address that separately in a few minutes because it. Uh, to me, for me, this, uh, and I, I want to also make sure up front that I, I, I cover very clearly uh, my total respect for everyone in this service, both uh, sworn and civilian, and, and the work that they accomplish each and every day. And so I'm not going to get into a long diatribe uh, with that. Uh, they understand, I think, for those that, that I've known so, so long around here, that the work is not the question. Uh, what I really want to say, though, is that and today, this is really a failure, and I accept some of the responsibility for that failure. In fact, it's a pretty huge failure when you look at policing across this country. Uh, when, when you know, I, I know what the legislation says. In fact, uh, you know, um, we have a few issues in our legislation. One of the ones I was thinking about the other night was just reflecting on the fact that uh, AMO and a whole bunch of groups, FCM, are working towards 
correcting some of this, but even when we have certain situations where we have suspended people where we pay them forever today, we have to follow the regulations and we do. And in many cases, we, we know it's wrong and there's a whole list of things that need to be addressed. This obviously is one of them. Now the service, it was very clear to me, the service is, uh, is hired by this board and certainly is the service and chief and the organization are employees of this, this community and this, this city and obviously are represented through a board which has a long history right going back to the British and New York and I'm not going to get into that so I understand how boards are supposed to work and I know how some of the rules are in place to, to give us coverage and, and, and whether we agree or we disagree. The, the huge failure is, is that if for, for the first time in my experience it hasn't been worked through. In fact even the other night when I got this this report at 5 o'clock, I, I didn't see it until Saturday because I've and then I, I had it, and I haven't had a chance to even speak to a number of my council colleagues, and I felt that was interesting in itself, even though I, I again, you know, I know Terry's mentioned that through the chair, through you. Uh, respectfully, I speak, uh, okay. I'm, I'm grateful that this has come forward, uh, but I, I need to make it very clear that uh, there's no sense of, of working through uh, the challenges uh, between this board, which are reflecting what its employee has put forward to this board, and I understand that. Uh, you are the boss, Madam Chair, the board's the boss, the chief isn't the boss. The bo it, it, operationally, yes, but he's not the boss. And the bottom line is, is that a uh, comment just made that, that it's had a, we have a sound strategy in place, and we do. But it's not a strong financial strategy, and, it, and that's being disputed. And I know it was said here that it, it wasn't being, our strategies aren't being disputed, they are being disputed have 15 council members who can't support this, can't support this. I mean, these are the people that represent the people of this community. They're the taxpayers. They're the people that I'm serving of, the chief's a servant of, and Madam Chair, you are as well. And I know there's legislation to provide the coverage, and I, quite frankly, there's a part of me that says, let's get on with the vote, let's do where it's got to go. But the bottom line is, is that what we're doing here is, 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 is we're, we have a situation where two major parts of this community are not coming together to solve a, 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 a an objective, which I think we all need to, to agree on. And it's been done historically. It's been done historically for years. Very seldom has anyone threatened going to OCOPS. I, I can speculate. In fact, if you need to know the truth, I think that if you want to speculate oh, OCOPS, in the past it's been very successful. We also know we're in, in, in terms of the, the service and, and the board, Madam Chair. So I, I, I know that I don't think that's where we want to be. That's not the issue here. The issue here is, is, is that we aren't working through a situation together, which can be accomplished. You know, uh, most organizations, it's difficult for people in the, in the, in the private sector, taxpayers, to understand how this all works. You know, most people have, and especially in these times, most people are told, by the superiors, this is what you need to do. And this is what we want you to do, and these are the resources you have at your disposal. No one comes back, they listen, but you know, they, they don't come back and tell you they can't do it. And, and everybody that, that we know, and most organizations today, is reducing their, their complement. And that was covered in the whereas is with, 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 the, with the city council. We made very clear that one of the big bones of contention are the increase in personnel. And obviously it's a matter of how do we accomplish what we saw on the board today with a per personnel level that everyone can live with. I'm suggesting to you that that can be accomplished. And as I said in one of the previous meetings here, uh, there's a number of major uh, senior personnel from across this country that probably would come in here and say we can do it and we will do it. I, it doesn't dispute so much the fact that, that, that the chief has got the wrong program. It's just one that strategically, I'm just saying, doesn't fit with another major component in our, in our society, and that happens to be council. The people that represent the taxpayers each and every day. I don't know about all the councillors, but I can know, tell you for a fact that there has been a terrific upswing in the number of comments and, and, and forwarded to us. And clearly, you know, they're not all going to be forwarded to the chief and the organization. And so, you know, we, we see it more. I've been seeing it for the last year, you know, when, when, when I've been cautioning us about personnel and, and, and increases. We've managed to torque this organization in so many ways. 
we may have over torqued it in some people's opinion as well. So I think we we just are missing the financial piece uh, in terms of torquing it up uh, because we haven't certainly missed other areas. And so for me, it's it's, it's a big disappointment. I think that 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 I'm I'm. The private sector doesn't understand it. They don't understand how we, as leadership, as their representative, as the so-called boss, can't tell someone. And of course, it's difficult because I know every so often there's an article in the paper. Again, I used that other example of how certain legislation and certain regulations cover certain situations because it pertains to policing. And all of us know that although we speak about those issues having to be rectified, uh, these there are other issues now. I think that are coming forward through organizations like AMO and, and through other councils that are seeing the same issue, uh, but not to this extent, but obviously we'll deal with this type of situation. So for me, I'm going to stay consistent with my council. Uh, it's That's another very difficult spot for me, Madam Chair, because you know uh, this board is, uh, is, is, is a big significance to me and certainly uh, in, in its role. And so today, uh, I have to again come to the Conclusion that it uh, will not fly only because it, it doesn't meet the criteria. And I understood uh, very clearly, and so does Council, that uh, we are not to look at it line by line. We are not getting into it line by line, but you need to know that fiscally we are looking at just the numbers. And uh, Council was very close and, and, and careful to craft its, its motion uh, to express its feelings as they feel the feedback led them to, uh, to do so. And so I'm going to stay consistent with that uh, with that position, and uh, respectfully uh, salute your work. And I know how difficult it has been for you and members of this board, and certainly the service. Uh, but that's my position, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to us today. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, to the chief. Um, since this budget discussion started in November, um, and with your request for new officers. The feedback has been, you know, why do we need more officers when crime is going down? Can you please share with us the expected impact to the citizens of Hamilton with these 15 new officers? Um, through you, Madam Chair, the officers, as I had mentioned, will be deployed directly to the front line. We know that we are facing challenges in service delivery. Uh, on many levels, uh, well articulated through the business presentation processes. Uh, just uh, today, uh, I was uh, finishing reviewing the uh, response time standards for the month of March. Um, we do have to supplement to the front line to ensure that when the phone rings, we have the ability to have our officers there when people call 911. We must have, in, uh, in support of the front line delivery of service, we must have an investigative response that has the ability to properly follow through on investigations in a very thorough manner, uh, which are well articulated through the requirements of law, through the decisions of the Supreme Court, through any new legislation that comes our way and places additional burdens on us. Uh, we are well positioned uh, to continue with the hiring of these new individuals on our efforts to keep our roads to be the safest and the uh, all-state insurance uh, we've moved up only, uh, over the last two years, we've moved up only three positions in making our roads safer, but that's very profound because I don't think anybody else on that list moved up three, three positions, so we're doing an incredible job. And we must be able to maintain the delivery of service at a service level that is expected in our community. Uh, we do not want to cut services, we do not want to withdraw services. Uh, we, ha we think that over the last 15, 20 years we have built a community policing model that fits and meets the needs of the citizens, uh, but the service delivery model must be enhanced with the new staff in order to maintain the same standard. So as we have heard uh, the councillor indicate that the service has hired 20 or uh, 82 individuals since 2000, we must keep in mind that 67 of those people are, are hired on grants that are from different levels of government, which we now are seeing dissipate. And when that money goes, those people go. So they are, in fact, not hires of the Hamilton Police Service. They are supported by grant funding. 
And as we have moved forward through this process and, and worked to the point where we are today, the service has shown tremendous respect for the process. We have met the spirit of negotiation, although I would argue that the public safety is not negotiable. It is, a, it is entrenched in the legislation and it is given to this service and to this service alone. But we have moved in this budget process from 6.28 to 5.25 to 4.75 to 3.9 to 3.71, and that's characterized as being entrenched in a position. I absolutely disagree. This council did not establish the benchmark until April the 3rd in its motion. So we have come to the table. We have come to the table in the spirit of cooperation. We have done everything in this service we can, and supplementing those 15 individuals and one civilian into our service will allow us to maintain the programs that we have in place now and maintain the service to the people. Thank you, Chief. So what I, what I saw in this motion that came from uh, council was that our budget was set at 140 million. $414,623.52. The chief has worked that budget to reflect the operating budget on that. Council does not address in terms of how we spend that budget. We expect the, the chief has to spend it. We, we give them the authority, whether or not today, of spending that money. I went to all the public consultations, and I heard overwhelmingly every one of those consultations across the city I have overwhelming support for the police. I didn't hear once anyone say decrease the number of officers. I also heard we want more officers on the streets. Overwhelming support of that. Yes, fiscal responsibility, 3.71, 5.254. We've come down to 3.71, and now before us we have 3.52. I also sat in on council on all those meetings. There was absolutely support across the board for the business plan. No. Absolutely raving support around the action strategy. Compliments to the entire force. I even heard one counselor say, wear your corporate hat, chief. Five hires, possibly ten hires. We sat and we, 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 we voted on a, on a, on a on 20, 21 new hires. Chief has come back looking at all the efficiencies, looking at all where he could cut, and he has come down and said to do this job effectively, function, resources, he has come down to 15. He's listened to, uh, to council. I listen to council. I'm a taxpayer too. I'm a taxpayer too. I live in Ancaster. I'm a taxpayer too. And so when I sit here, I not only sit here looking first and foremost, and I can pull out the police uh, legislative act around my responsibility, and first on that list is public safety, to ensure public safety. I take that responsibility very, very to heart. I also take my responsibilities as a taxpayer to heart. This budget is set at $140 million. The chief has presented that. He's not compromising the service to the community. He's not compromising public safety. And he has come down to wearing that corporate hat that, that Councillor Jackson said, negotiate around hires. He didn't say no new hires. He said hires within the negotiations. And I am... Um, <coughs> I'm glad that the chief came in with this budget before us, and we have an opportunity to further the discussion around the table and then vote the court and vote. Yeah, the comments. Well, I, I just would like to make a couple of comments, and uh, I have to start with you, Mayor Bob Bertina. I sincerely need to commend you for your commitment to public safety in the city. Uh, you have clearly analyzed all the data that has been provided to this board throughout this process. As you have so eloquently mentioned in numerous occasions, we, are, we as members of the board have a responsibility to ensure that public safety in this city is not compromised. I am mindful of our legal responsibility as a board to ensure the provision of adequate and effective police services in the city of Hamilton. This mandate is clearly set out in Section 31 of the Police Services Act. 
I will be supporting the recommendation for a 3.52 budget because I believe that the hiring of more officers is a priority for this service that we can no longer ignore. <coughs> As a board, we must provide the service with the tools and resources required to succeed in light of the community expectation of public safety. The Chief has presented a sound business case, supported by extensive data and reports to this board and to the community through forums. This budget process has been open and transparent and subject to various vigorous debate. We as a board should indeed be proud of our process. It's been difficult, as um, Councillor Morelli says, but we need to be proud of the process. Tonight I will support the recommendation because it includes the hiring of new officers, which I supported from day one. We just saw last week the approval to hire individuals at City Council because the case was made that two councillors needed extra help in their offices so that calls from their constituents could be answered. A sum of over 98,000 was committed to these two hirings. Well, this city needs the extra officers so that public safety across the city is not compromised. I want to stress that during the two and a half day business plan meetings, which all members of this board with the exception of the councillors uh, who did not attend, all the community stakeholders, and I say all of them, they were stakeholders who represented communities across the city, made it clear that public safety is, is the number one priority in the city. We all sit around this table as police service board members, as equals, in the delivery of adequate and effective police service in this community. This is a board budget. This is a board budget. And the board will make the decision in terms of how this recommendation moves forward this evening. Madam Chair, I, I just want to provide clarification. I uh, highlighted uh, board budgets. You need to understand that uh, that 98000 actually precluded a savings over $500,000. So now, in fact, it was a savings to the taxpayer, not an expense. This is different. Okay, and I, 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 mean, um, I, I think it's been all fair. So I, I really trying to retain some decorum, but I, I think they were all committed to public safety. And, uh, and I, I, I salute your, you know, recognizing the mayor, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, sorry that you didn't recognize me. Because I know I'm not that much here. But having said that, I think it's really, you know, I don't want to turn this into a big debate. I think it's very clear. It's a failure. Failure, Madam Chair, you need to recognize it as such. And I, you know, I go to those community meetings, and I can tell you how many are there, and I can tell you how many police are there, and I can tell you, I hear, uh, you know, people comment, and I, we, we all hear people comment, and I can tell you, councillor, whoever said whatever, but I can tell you, 15 councillors voted down this budget. So I don't know, you know, you can go to these meetings, and all I'm saying to you, we 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 failed, we have failed. I accept responsibility for that failure, okay? Because you have a council that, that sits and listens to people every day, not just through a business plan. And all of us have been through the business plan. I don't make any apologies for not attending a business plan and working with members of this community. That's historic for me. And I can tell you that there's nothing more that I want than public safety in this community. I also know that there's a number of ways to skin the cat. And we haven't found it that it's mutually acceptable by both sides of the equation, and therefore we fail. And I'm big enough to take part of responsibility, if not have, for that failure. And I expect that this service will as well. So I, I have no no problem, Madam Chair. But this is not a we versus them. This is we have failed. And so that I need to make those comments. And I can tell you that I'm committed to public safety. And anyone who wants to convey that we're not on this board needs to, to really make an apology. So I'm, I just think, I took offense to that comment, citing one person is committed to public safety. Well, I did indicate we are all equals. Well, that no, chair, I, did, I did attend, I think only missed one, and to suggest that no one had comments about the police budget and, and affordability. Uh, we Obviously, we weren't at the same meeting, and there's no question that there was a, 
uh, a huge amount of, uh, of, of preserves individuals in those community, probably more than actual residents in every case except one I didn't attend. And secondly, uh, uh, the reality is is that I, I don't know how anyone has a monopoly on, on, on the issue of safety. Um, when, when, when it was phrased the way it was, I was sitting back and I said, oh my God, because I don't support, I guess I'm unsafe. Well, you know what, I don't necessarily uh, 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 like that kind of response. I think that when I take a look at the budget, I look at the balance of all issues, including financial and fiscal uh, areas, and on the, at the end, I firmly believe, and I respect your views, Madam Chair, we do, I do. But I, really, I hope you respect mine, that I believe that, I believe, in my heart of hearts, and all those thousands of individuals that contacted many of us counselors over the last number of months, I believe we could, with this chief, deliver a very safe policing service and continue to do so at the current budget. Yeah. Madam Chair, uh, just briefly, because I think we need to get to the yes. vote, but uh, my predecessor began his term with uh, an insistence that 100 officers be added to the complement <coughs> through the term. And as we heard, 21 in fact uh, were. And I've also heard uh, two of my predecessors comment um, that they understood the need and the position that I was in that I continue to insist that we need to add to the complement. And I would prefer to 20, and I think the chief was uh, very cognizant of the cost to the community because the, the plan that we all approved was for 61, 61 officers, and he knew that by doing that, it would, be, it would be very onerous on the taxpayer. So we're working incrementally toward where we need to be. And not only did I crunch the numbers that we uh, brought forward, but I did my own research. 15 ways to Sunday. I'm actually tired of reading about these issues, but I wanted to be sure that I could support what was presented. I guarantee you, Madam Chair, I am completely comfortable. I do not feel a failure. I think we've met the Council's uh, budgetary demand as well as the needs of the service as deemed by the professionals that we hired to give us that information. Thank you. And I would now like to call the recommendation because you know we could go on all night in terms of I said, you said, we said. So I would like to put forward the recommendation that the Hamilton Police Services Board approve the 2013 Hamilton Police Service operating budget as amended. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Mayor, move it. Second. Oh, the mayor's moving. Yes, second. Second. No, the mayor's moving. I'll move it. Oh, you seconded? Thank you. Reported. Yes, reported. 5.2, Centum All Crime Prevention Center. Chair, members of the board, this is a recommendation that the board enter into uh, the agreement uh, to relocate the community policing center, Centum All. Uh, to 460 Barton and attached uh, to this is the explanation. Essentially, we are uh, increasing the size of the facility. Sorry? Uh, increasing the size of the facility for the same cost, given the fact that there's a change of ownership in the current location and the, uh, and the rent is going up, uh, the community mobilization section and look for an alternative uh, location. And that is the recommendation uh, for this report. Can we have a move to that? Do I need to second it? Irene, all in favor? Here. 5.3, um, can we have an approval that we send the Ontario Association $1,500 towards their new upcoming spring training to level and second it? And uh, 5.4 is just an approval to receive the correspondence as printed. Mayor, uh, Irene, thank you. Any new business? Hearing done. We adjourn for 10 minutes before the camera, please. Or, or having a, a small amount of a, a, a pot on them or, or whatever they might have. Uh, I look at that and I look at the crime index. I'm trying to understand how the action team 
which they're justifying, really addresses the crime index, the severity of crime index issue, when it really is addressing a lot of the small stuff. So why do you think the chief is so protective of the action program? It's his creation. I mean, well, the action team existed, in fairness, uh, prior to him arrive. We received a grant. We had 20 officers through the grant. Maybe that was during his time, but the additional 20 officers uh, since his time. And uh, so he expanded on something that was working, and he took it from other beats. And, uh, and I asked a question a while ago, um, what were they doing? What kind of successes were those organizations, whether it was the, uh, the back room or the heat or the barrier unit where they stripped officers or even front line? What were their achievements? What was the benchmarking in regards to their context, arrest, uh, and, and, and uh, charges versus what we got now? And, and the problem is I have no historic information to, to determine whether we're getting to value based on what we have now versus what we had before. Uh, Terry, one of the neighborhood associations wrote a letter to the Police Services Board. They're supporting the action strategy. How do you respond to that letter? Well, let's not mix the two up. Action strategy is something I support. I said that already. The action team and how many officers are actually in the action team is what I don't support. The question clearly comes to me is when you put seven officers over and above uh, a high ratio of officers already placed in downtown neighborhoods in downtown, and this is a supplement too, and they're giving out traffic tickets. Let's get this straight. They're giving out traffic tickets and they're wearing yellow jackets while the rest of the community are screaming for police services. I don't know if that's good value for your dollar. And now we've set up a scenario next year, these hires will be on the budget next year. How do you believe council's gonna to react to that next budget cycle? Well, I think, that I, you know, I, I believe that uh, this council has been pretty consistent from day one, pushing for the zero target. I think they'll do the exact same thing uh, next year, and I believe that, uh, uh, that if we're looking at anything over that target, uh, when I, the police services budget, we'll, we'll have a rough ride. The level of service that our community has become accustomed to, those officers are required in order to maintain adequate and effective policing in our community. So you're saying you can't provide the same thing to We are providing excellence and delivery of service to all facets of the community that require policing, right from protecting women from domestic violence and sexual assault, protecting children, and making sure that we have the ability in our service to ensure a proper follow-up investigations, thorough investigations, and presentations to our board. You're not really answering the question, or you? I, I have answered the question. Next. Anything? What about um, Councillor Whitehead's uh, comment that the action team is mostly handing out um, provincial offense notices rather than making criminal arrests and that that's not a good use of resources? Uh, an inaccurate characterization of the excellent work that they do. The strategic analysis shows us the 17 categories of uh, uh, 17 areas of the city. Uh, 13 major categories of violent crime in our community where we need to deploy our officers and yes they do enforcement but there are also criminal arrests there are drug arrests there are support to victims of crime there is report taking there is backup for other officers there is the ability within that as well as uh, identified by uh, Staff Sergeant Schulenberger to, that uh, they can canvass and get involved in major case investigations too where we never had that ability before without depleting the resources on the front line so this strategy gives us capacity to work in the local neighborhoods to establish programs and relationships and to help get over that enforcement that is required because let's remember that priority number one in the five pillars of police is crime prevention. That's where we need to spend more money, not on the enforcement, but on the prevention. That's a big part of what they do. But Chief, has the police association itself not questioned whether uh, the action team is worthwhile? Uh, the police association can respond to your question and answer that. We are, we are confronted with the mandate of providing adequate policing in the city, and that is our responsibility in the service. Are you concerned what the budget process is going to look like next year? Are you worried it's going to be this all over again? This is a excellent, public, transparent process where we have had substantial dialogue open to the public, engaged by the public, understanding by the public. And I think that the process it, it is a success in that it works and it achieves what it is supposed to achieve, the provision of public safety in our community. Councilor Morelli called this a failure on behalf of the Police Services Board. 
passing this budget? How do you respond to that? Anytime we engage in dialogue in the public about public safety and the critical issues that confront our city, that is a success. And this budget is providing us the ability to provide excellence and service to the entire community. So Chief, this is a success. Are you still committed to the business plan in terms of, I think it was 67 officers that I hear? Uh, the uh, seven year strategic staffing plan uh, calls for uh, 61 officers over time. And what we're doing, uh, Richard, is we're taking a very strategic approach to implementing the recommendations of that plan, but in concert with the other programs that are taking place. The case management, uh, case preparation unit, centralized core of people doing paperwork to relieve the burden on our frontline officers. We are continuing to uh, update niche with our property module to make it more efficient, less time consuming. We're looking at different programs that we're going to continue to put in place to save officers time and we're going to take a measured response to acquiring officers and we'll evaluate each year as we move into the budget process what we require in the way of staffing versus what we require in, the, in terms of technology or business process re-engineering to, to find that balance. That's what we have to do. And you've got one more. Yeah. And Chief, does done. the hiring of the 15 officers meet council's, the spirit of council's resolution? The hiring of 15 officers helps us to meet what is and required that's in law. What is required in law is for the Hamilton Police Service to meet the mandate of providing adequate and effective public safety. And that's what this service has done. In respect, that's not the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.